Hi, everyone. I am your host, Jade Haggard, podcasting from Art Universe Laboratory. Welcome to Artist Solace. Hello again, and thank you for listening to episode 15 of Artist Solace. Today's guest is musician Sam Anderson. Sam is a trombonist currently attending Yale University who received a scholarship to obtain his master's degree in trombone performance at Yale. He was gracious enough to be on the show two days before making his journey out east and after having only met me two weeks prior to this recording. I was very honored to have him on and learn about his experience pursuing his music, especially on such short notice. Sam was born in South Carolina. He lived in Nashville, Tennessee while getting his bachelor's degree in trombone performance, then moved to Muncie, Indiana to attend Ball State. Sam left Ball State after realizing their graduate program wasn't right for him. Up until he moved to Connecticut this past summer, he, gra- he generated an income by freelancing his trombone skills and teaching around Indianapolis, Indiana. We find out what his experience has been like pursuing his music, what and who inspires him, and what may be in store for him in the future. Thanks, Sam, for your inspiration and insight and advice and for coming and being a guest on the show right before you moved. Thanks for inspiring me to try and share my own unique art while not feeling like I have to prove anything to anyone. I hope you enjoy the show. Today I have with me Sam Anderson. Sam is a trombonist, and today we're going to talk to him about what his experience has been like pursuing his music. Sam, thanks for coming today. Thanks for having me, Jade. All the way from Muncie. All the way. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, I had another guest one time. He was from Columbus, Indiana. Okay. Or not from, but he lived in Columbus, Indiana, and I thought he lived in town. And, <laughs> and he's like, no, I drove an hour. Like, like, do you want guest money? You know? <laughs> yeah, it's just exciting to be here. Awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate it. it. I yeah, really appreciate you. it. And in such short notice... And two days, I think, before you That's move. That's great. I move uh, to New Haven, Connecticut on Friday, pretty much. Connecticut. Yep. And yeah. because you're going to Yale, correct? That's right. I'll start a master's degree there. Master's degree. Yeah. Fascinating. How do you feel, man? How are you feeling about it? <laughs> um, terrified. <laughs> it's a hard program <laughs> I hear. Um, yeah, it, it feels kind of surreal to be able to go to a university like that. Um, I, I did my undergrad at Vanderbilt. Um, which also felt totally surreal, um, living in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and then I moved to Muncie, Indiana for Ball State to start a master's, um, but it wasn't totally the right school for me. So I've been freelancing in the area for the last year. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, yeah, you answered all the questions, and I was like, where's Vanderbilt? Yeah. Where? What are you doing in Muncie? <laughs> and. You said for the last year you've lived in Muncie? Uh, For the past two years. Two years, okay. I did a year of school and left, and then a year of working as a musician. Uh, And it pays rent, so that's exciting. Wow, that's good. You don't Mm -hmm. have to work any external jobs. That's right, yeah. Well, I tried. Uh, No one called me back (laughs) for interviews, so I made up my own jobs. Awesome. Fascinating. Yeah. And how old are you? 24. 24. Mm -hmm. That sounds like perfect timing. It is, yeah. Now, where are you from? South Carolina originally. Really? Um, yeah. Okay. Born in Charleston uh, and was raised in Greenwood, South Carolina. When did you move to... So you, you were born in South Carolina, raised. Mm-hmm. Then then you went to Nashville? Right, for, for undergrad. Wow. Yeah, 2013 to 17. Yeah. Um, what was your major then? Trombone performance. Trombone performance. Yeah. Okay. So I just studied music all day, every day. Uh, it was a good time. Yeah. Yeah. I was a barista for a little while. Um, Before I moved to Nashville, I went to an art school, kind of like fame, but just in South Carolina, not L.A. or New York City. Is it, you know, the old TV show. Um, So I I got to finally take private lessons uh, and be surrounded by artists who uh, either act, write, uh, do anything in the arts. So So it was just like a collective arts It was a utopia, for sure. Really? Mm -hmm. What was the name of that? Uh, The South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities. South Carolina, govern. It's a mouthful, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, 
Uh, so you basically audition, um, and it's uh, free tuition. You pay for a meal plan, unless you're on a scholarship. Whoa. And, yeah. It's a pretty good deal. You live in the dorms, and uh, it's basically pre-college. Wow. Uh, yeah. It was a really nice place to be. Yeah. Awesome. So now you're... Man. <laughs> so Yale is in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Wow. How... <laughs> How did you get that opportunity? Well, um, I auditioned uh, in 2017 uh, and was waitlisted, um, but I really enjoyed the the area and the, the teacher uh, and just what it seemed Yale has to offer. You had um, to travel there then to audition? That's right. I took a plane from Nashville uh, and a plane back, um, yeah, and so had to make it back to na- classes. you were living in Nashville at the time? Mm-hmm. I was still in my undergraduate. I see. Yeah. Um, so I, I auditioned, uh, loved everything about it. It wasn't quite good enough at the time. Um, so ah. I came to Ball State and practiced a lot. Yeah. You didn't give up, so you still had it set in your mind. That's right. That so I, I reapplied uh, this past spring semester. Okay. And yeah, it, Apparently that worked out. <laughs> yeah, I was still waitlisted, but they got down to me and yeah, gave me a nice call. And uh, How did you feel when you got that call, man? Excited, uh, in awe. Um, definitely surprised. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, they took four people to the live audition, um, and we're all friends with each other. Uh, we're all the same kind of bass trombonists in the same age range, so uh, it was really competitive and uh, exciting. It was like a they reunion. all tried out, mm-hmm. yeah, and you got picked, or they? Uh, we all were accepted, but on a waitlist basis. So they okay. started with a friend of mine, and went to another friend, and then got to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I was the first one to accept the offer. Superman. Yeah. Did you always have Yale in your mind? Never. <laughs> no, what? Um, so what sparked that decision then? It's free. Um, the only reason it wasn't in my mind, I just didn't think I was at that level um, to be competing uh, with people in that caliber. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it, it was kind of on a whim to apply the first time. And since I got so close, I figured, hey, I'm auditioning again. I'll try out. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) How was it free? What do you mean? Uh, Someone gave a huge grant. um, So all the master's students, the whole music school is graduate students. um, And it's very small. uh, So everyone who goes is tuitions covered. And they get a nice stipend. A small stipend. But, yeah. So... I get a little money for going to school. Awesome, man. Yeah. So far, no loans for colleges or anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big thing, you know, so. Yeah, it's a bit, very big deal. Yeah. Yeah, man. Good for you. Yeah, thank That's you. That's awesome. Yeah. Nice to hear that. Yeah. And I wish you the best of luck with that, man. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's I mean, very I haven't terrifying. heard it, much of your music. I've just done a little bit of research. Sure. Um, but, you know, someone tells me that you got accepted to Yale. I'm thinking you're probably competent <laughs> i try and play Absolutely. in tune and in time it's, yeah it's tough but now so when did you first start getting interested in music uh well i started at 11 um and by about high school i started um, playing gigs at churches and um, in pit orchestras i uh, started doing well in competitions and uh it just seemed like a nice career option uh, where i didn't have to sit behind a desk and yeah uh, have a nine to five, so I could just make music or and make it's art. So fun. Yeah. At eleven, now did you? Were you in middle school then? I was. Uh, sixth grade is when they started us in the band programs, uh, and I was tall enough to reach the end of the slide. So. Oh yeah, nice. They stuck a trombone in my hand. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't have really much of an option of what instrument. Um, yeah. So anything else you know would have been, like just. Awkward. I guess I could imagine you. Yeah, with a flute. Like, yeah I could try and play played. flute, but it probably hurt my wrists a little bit more. Uh, yeah, the the trombone just seemed to fit with my personal thoughts, and uh, it just clicked with me. I so, see. Yeah, I see. Yeah, it was just a mouthpiece to express my ideas for uh, all of middle and high school, and so far since then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, now, what did you do in middle school? Was that mostly like playing little concerts and stuff? Yeah, you know, play tunes did, by ear and yeah. Did you play? Uh, did you play in the marching band? In high oh, school? of course. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> can't get away from that. Uh, Man, I, I played flute in middle school, but when I got to high school, I gave it up. 
That's fair. You know. <laughs> I don't and know. you play some clarinet too? Some, yes. That's awesome. I learned from an elderly man I used to care for. Okay. About five years ago. He was a musician. He played in the Navy jazz band during World War II. Came back to the U.S., went to Butler. Mm. Met his wife there, who was a clarinetist as well. So they were both clarinetists. Wow. And um, he just played music throughout his life. He worked primarily as a salesman, but okay. would play. He was a well-known jazz musician through Indianapolis. Sure. And I think the whole state, from what his kids said. I don't right. think he never really, he never really <laughs> traveled internationally, but sure. from what they say, he was really good. Um, now, when I started cleaning for him and taking care of him, he had a house full of instruments. <laughs> and I was really getting interested in playing music at that time. And... Uh, I have to say the clarinet was probably the funnest, easiest thing. Actually, was came easy for me. And I would just sure. sit. He'd be just sitting at his kitchen table playing. He had a little dementia, too, but he could remember okay. all of his music. That's you awesome. Know? Yeah. That's another fascinating that's, thing. Yeah, people who... Uh, the music's probably one of the last things to go, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard studies that prove that mm -hmm. as well it's the most rewarding people to play for i think is people in nursing homes they definitely appreciate you ever do that uh, as much as i can yeah okay um, so. you do that around indianapolis or not so much in this area um, i see yeah lately i've just been taking gigs that pay uh so i can make rent and everything <laughs> but um when i'm back home or when i'm up uh, visiting my grandpa in his nursing home i'll play something for Aww. them yeah that's awesome yeah now uh so, so yeah. So I learned clarinet. I could just sit and watch him play, and I learned that way. And oh, yeah. I just I love the sound. Hmm. And um, he passed away. Um, then his instruments were all distributed amongst his family members. Um, then I wound up buying one from somebody in our neighborhood who sold it to me for $50, and I had it repaired for 100 and something. Sure. It's a silver clarinet. Hmm. So... I'd say I'm most proficient on the clarinet, even though I don't play it as much, you know? Right. Yeah. Sometimes instruments can uh, just fit yeah. with a person. Yeah. And that's wonderful to find, too. Uh, and making music, as, even as a hobby, is uh, one of the best things you can do, I think. Um, that's what I say. Yeah. And I tell people, too, it, like if, if you want to be smarter, if you want to learn a language, um, yeah. and just be sharper... That's right. Yeah, it's fascinating how, how slow the progress takes. Um, uh, yeah. You can spend hours a day and not see any improvement for a while. That's, mm -hmm. um, but Yeah, do you mostly play jazz or classical on it? Dude, I don't even know. You know, <laughs> like, so I want to play professionally. I just don't know which instrument I want to focus on. Sure. And I don't really know what genre. Like, yeah. I know what songs I like to he listen to and sing to. Mm. Uh, Leah came over one night and she kind of, we played for about an hour on the guitar and uh, um, we played like Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. Yeah. You know, and so she was helping me with that. And cool. that's about as close as I've gotten in the past, <laughs> since since my friend Bob died, you know. Sure. Of someone actually helping me play. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's in my future plans at Good. some point. Yeah. But I really, I really value the, the, the um, effect mm. it has on my brain. And right. I can notice a difference. Yeah. Anything you know? in particular that it, that you've noticed? Uh, I can pick up on language more. Um, I work at my job. I work with a lot of Hispanics. Okay. And I, I have previous knowledge of learning Spanish from high school. Right. Um. Ever since I've worked there, it's, I've worked there for three years now, I've been practicing with them off and on, but whenever I'm really focusing on music, mm. I can pick up on the language more. I can... Sure. I, I, I'm i more receptive to hearing the language and understanding what they're saying. Yeah, I, so, I um, guess through practicing or opening up your ears in a musical mm -hmm. context that relates to other aspects mm -hmm. uh, of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating. I, I don't know anything about brains or anything, but yeah, it's it's fun to to notice those changes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
What's um, do you play any other instruments, or are you just trombone? Uh, really anything that pays in the brass world. Um, <laughs> but I don't play trumpet well. Uh, I don't play tuba well. But any type of trombone. Um, what? How many types of trombone are there? <laughs> There's um, soprano trombone, which is mostly a trumpet, uh, just with a slide. There's alto trombone, which is in a different key. Um, uh, tenor trombone and bass trombone. Okay. And sometimes contrabass trombone. If is yeah. that lower than a bass? Yeah, it's about five and a half feet tall. And yeah. Holy crap. Yeah, it sounds like a tuba <laughs> with a slide. It's Have you ever played on one of those? Just a few times, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's lots of fun. Uh, so you hear it in movie soundtracks a lot, or okay. um, yeah, sometimes chamber music will use it, but it's a beast of an instrument. Uh, I've never heard of that. Contra, yeah. contra bass. Contra bass trombone. Oh my. Yeah. I was aware of those levels as far as a saxophone. Mm-hmm. I knew there. I know there were. There's an alto, tenor, soprano. Right. Yeah. And is there a bass? Yes. In saxophone world. Yeah, it's pretty big too. Uh, usually in big bands, bass sax. I think it's bass. Yeah. And okay. Plays a lot with the bass trombone in that setting. Yeah. So how do you get um, commissioned? to play. Are you part of like a union or anything? No, I'm not part of any union in in the area. Um, Mostly it's through people I know already. Um, So when I left school, I um, just called a bunch of my friends who were working full-time as musicians, and I bought them beers and said, (laughs) hey, what are you doing and how can I do it? Mm -hmm. Uh, So they got me in touch with uh, teachers in the area so I could start teaching lessons and sectionals. And that's really the bulk of the the money that I found as a musician in this area. Um, but every now and then a gig will come up or, you know, someone will need a trombonist or uh, anything really, and uh, I'll get a call and yeah. say, yes, please. So you said the bulk of your income would be teaching? Mm-hmm. Yeah, at least at, here in Indiana. Yeah. So working with middle and high school students. Mostly. Now are they already taking lessons at school? They just need some Hopefully. help? Or, um, or like... Most of the time I would go into the school system um, and just Whoa. pull kids out of the band class and say, hey, play your scales. Or, you know, you're not in tune here. Go practice. Did you like, like that? that? How do you like that? I love teaching. Um, I taught uh, karate when I was younger. Karate? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. I started at seven and... Um, in my school, it was a small town in South Carolina, and uh, I was able to be an instructor by 11, pretty much. Mm-hmm. So I, I've been teaching. By 11? And, yeah. It was weird. Uh, <laughs> I, there's one memory. Uh, I was teaching a, a kickboxer how to throw a roundhouse kick, and he was maybe in his mid-30s, six foot five, well over 250 pounds, <laughs> solid guy. And I was this little scrawny kid going through puberty, and I said, hey, this is how you do it. <laughs> and he did it flawlessly and knocked the bag, and I said, well, I can't even do that, so you're doing something right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, teaching's been a, a big part of my life uh, for pretty much as long as I can remember. Okay. Um, and teaching music just makes sense. Um, it, I think, for me, music or art in general should be shared. Uh, so if you can talk with the younger generation or really any person that's interested to listen, uh, it's always fun to share your thoughts on that particular art. Yeah. It's kind of like mentoring, in mm-hmm. a sense. Yeah. Uh, and even in this setting, the podcast setting, where you can um, uh, just share your ideas. It's, Absolutely. It's really uh, enriching, I think. Ideas, yeah. Inspiration, too. That's my goal. Yeah. Because I need a lot of that. <laughs> Me, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's something, man, about those creative people. It's yeah. just a different brain. They just inspire you to work or practice or yeah. whatever. And that's why do. this has been probably the most gratifying thing sure. I've done to date. Mm. I was pursuing, like I said, I was pursuing visual art for 15 years and went to school for it. Um, I just gave up on it because I didn't think I was passionate about it, you know. Sure. So anyway, I started the podcast and people have been showing up. They've been wanting to do it, and it's been great. Yeah. It's been amazing, and it's been gratifying because, you know, everyone, it, I've been drawing inspiration from people, and I hope to shine a little light on my guests and maybe the art community in general. Right, and you pull in people from all art disciplines, right? Yeah, for now. You know, for sure. now, it's my, my criteria 
for interviewing guests is you have to be pursuing some kind of creative art and you have to want to do it full time. Right. There's a difference between people who want to do it full time and people who just do it as a hobby. Right. You know, like yeah, just a, a different set of problems and more intense problems. That's or right. Issues or. Yeah. I, I've noticed that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So appreciate you coming. That's my pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> um, you were mentioning earlier that you listened to Sam Harris. That's right. Why? Yeah. Um, there's something about, uh, for me, it's the phrasing that he speaks in, um, or the, yeah, his cadences are, uh, calming for me. And, uh, as a person who doesn't have a job, who also works, uh, you know, as a freelance musician, uh, it's, it's nice to have a slow, calm conversation going on, whether it's while I do dishes or get ready for the day or even practice, I'll listen to some podcasts. I see. Um, and his, uh, his meditations are really helpful for me. I see. Yeah. I interviewed a writer, Danny, Danny Geyer. He yeah. is a fan of Sam Harris and he talked about his, what did he call it? Mindfulness? Yeah. Being present in the moments. Yeah. Really helpful in all aspects of life. I yeah. Think. That was interesting yeah. and inspiring. Yeah, I just listened to that podcast the day a day or so ago. Really? Yeah, it was nice. I yeah. and Sam Harris is someone I haven't really listened to him, but I know of him because I I mostly listen to Jordan Peterson. Mm, yeah. And you said you listen to Joe Rogan too. So I'm yeah, sure you probably I, know who I that guy. I love Jordan is. Peterson. Yeah. Um, really? I actually haven't read his book Twelve Rules for Life yet. You got to read that before you go to Yale. That's, that's what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> I I do make my bed in the morning, so you know. Now, have you always been like that? Uh, making my bed in the yeah. morning? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe by the time I started moving out uh, of my parents' house, I, I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll pretend I'm an adult now. I'm 17. <laughs> uh, so I, I started making my my room, uh, keeping things organized. My car is not organized, but uh, yeah, my, yeah, I try to make everything else somewhat... Uh, just start with your own bed. Mm-hmm. Just start small. Start at one place and move from there. Yeah, that's um, good, man. Because usually, I, if I think of myself when I was eighteen, I didn't start really valuing <laughs> making my bed until last year. Sure. <laughs> well, if you accomplish one thing in the day, you know it's it leads to to more things that you can accomplish. Uh, yeah. You already have that one thing you've you've done right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and you can only do. Um, what you can do in a day, you know, so, uh, things that, uh, may be stressing you in the past, uh, you know, that was in the past. You can't really change how those things have gone, but if you start by making your bed, you can, um, have a more positive outlook, I think, uh, even though it's something silly as making your bed. It seems absurd, doesn't it? Yeah. But, but it's so practical and pragmatic that... Yeah, it, the way, well, the way Peterson explained it, just... It's so clear and, yeah. Well, this is why you need to make your bed, because you can't criticize <laughs> right. the community. Yeah. Or, uh, or like, political Yeah, taking issues, responsibility you know? for your own actions, I think, is a, a powerful message. Yeah. It's, it's important to hear and to think about, I think. Yeah, and that's why, you know... Um, that is another reason why I was inspired to start this podcast, and I gave up on my art after sure. I read his book. Okay. You know, because yeah. he he says, he advises you that if something isn't working out in your life, and maybe you should give it up. Mm. <laughs> and I thought... It's hard to hear yeah. sometimes, too. It's kind of, it was relieving, too. Mm. Like, well, maybe I should just give it up for a while and sure. focus on something else. Yeah, so mm. the why the switch to doing a podcast... I have had the idea for about 10 years now. Okay. That's a good question. (laughs) Well, yeah, it's like I had the idea for a long time, and the equipment's actually reasonably... um, not expensive. I can't think of the word. Not <laughs> yeah. expensive. Reasonably well, cheap. Right. If you just buy this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
and I think it's just because I want to make it more about other people than mm. just me. Sure. And it's another way to shine some light into the community, you know. Right. I think that's great. Yeah. You're gaining experience and you're also helping those around you, I think. Uh, yeah. I hope, you know. Right, in in any way you can. And you know, I don't even so. really care if people are listening right now, but sure. it's helping me and maybe yeah. it'll help you a little bit. And Working then... through our own ideas, I think. Sure. It's, and I definitely don't talk to people much about uh, what's going on in my mind about art or anything, so it's nice having a format. To... Yeah, that's the thing, too. I, I don't really talk, make small talk about it, especially if I'm at work. It's right. Just, yeah, you know. a lot of people don't want to listen or um, they don't have the time. Um, but if you set a certain time to have a conversation about it uh, where you know that's what you're going to be talking about, it, it leaves the door open for uh, at least you to work out through your own thoughts, I think. Yeah, yeah. it's like a therapy, man. Because yeah. I have two kids, man. and mm. you know, How old are they? They're three and four. Good and ages. It's It's hectic. Life, you know, obviously, there's a lot of responsibility, and I try to maintain, mm. make sure I'm taking care of myself and everyone else, and I think this is just, this is just a nice outlet sure. to talk to somebody, set aside like an hour, one week, every week, and talk about yeah. art experiences. Most primarily, you know, you, and mm. what your journey has been like, and right. what your life is like. Yeah, so. that makes sense. But really, yeah, I, I drew a lot of inspiration from Peterson. And mm. before him was Joe Rogan. Yeah. Well, and he's the, I think, stepping stone, I think, in those uh, yeah, type of conversations. Yeah, because I don't even really listen to Joe Rogan anymore. Right. The only time I will is if I'm listening to Peter, re-listening to Peterson's. <laughs> yep. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's how I got into listening to Joe Rogan was I started with Jordan Peterson. and. Uh, oh, you there's... started with Jordan Peterson. <laughs> yeah. Really? Um, I, someone had sent me a link, I think, to a YouTube channel. Uh-huh. And, um, I thought the what he was talking about was, I suppose it's controversial. It's intense, but, man. Yeah, people don't seem to like him, and then some people do. Some um, people. I think if you listen to what he says, you probably will like some it. Some people don't like him. A lot of people, he says, actually do. Yeah. And actually, it, things are real positive. He seems to be helping people. I, I think that's Just all we can hope for. Just bringing some damn reality to the world, man. <laughs> it's needed. Stop lying and... Mm. quit and you know what <laughs> I'll, I'll say one more thing and then we'll get back to you I'm so sure. um one of the biggest impacts he had on me was I was able to let go of this stigma of feeling like I had to compete with men sure or I had to prove to the world that I can do all these things I can work a job full time and have <laughs> kids and buy my own house right I started listening to him and just it totally changed my perception. Mm. In, like, in what way? I just appreciate more the fact that I'm a mom and I need to be spending time with my kids, especially mm. the first three or four years. Yeah. I say, So I regret a little bit not appreciating them sure. as much and yeah. trying to work more right but you know things happened in our life where i had to work i had to mm -hmm. kind of step up a little bit but yeah that you know so my perception on um i guess gender roles you know mm. um luckily my kids are young enough now that you know i can kind of appreciate them a little bit more if right. that makes sense it's really the the stigma part of this this feminist movement of not being equal to men like sure sure we're not you know yeah we're I, different people you know and so i appreciate appreciate that i guess that's the biggest thing i'm not trying mm. to compete i'm trying to go into things with the idea of competing with myself and not anybody else right that's been the huge improvement mm. yeah you know? just that one shift and how you think about it uh or how you think about yourself and your yeah. role with other people. That, yeah, I think if if you're doing anything and you're competing with other people, uh, there's always someone better. There's always of course people who work harder or people who don't work as hard and are still better or people who are much worse. Um, 
But if you're just right. focusing on yourself and taking care of your own stuff, uh, it seems to be a better mindset. I yeah. Think. Yeah. It was like soaking up. I think it's real easy to soak up that stigma mm. of me feeling like, oh, I'm oppressed and men are just <laughs> trying to bring me down. Really easy. Right. And I didn't realize that until I, you know, I listened to what he was saying. Sure. Like, yeah, finding someone else shit. to blame your problems on. I've or... been wrong this whole time. I should <laughs> just do these things because I want to, not because sure. I need to prove to anybody and that I'm, I can. There's always truth that someone has, you know, slighted you in some way or... Um, even not someone in particular, but, you know, there's always an excuse, I think. Uh, there's always a reason to give someone else blame. Uh, yeah, but right. But if you try and let that go, I think it's better for the world and it's better for you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a good code, mm. paradigm of thinking that I think Yeah. can prevent, uh, you know, genocide from happening again. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been reading The Ordinary Men and... The Gulag Archipelago that okay. Peterson suggests as well. Yeah. So I've been, I've been doing my homework now. <laughs> yeah. But it's been great. I think I talk about him probably every other podcast, you know? Yeah, but he has a profound impact on people. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I just read a Dostoevsky, actually. I finished really? it at the coffee shop before I came what's, over here. Now, what's the name of the Dostoevsky? It's uh, Memoirs from the House of the Dead. Memoirs. Okay, and then what's that about? It's just about his... Uh, uh, his time in the the Siberian prisons. And, okay. Yeah. That's so the Gulag Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's hardcore, um, <sighs> and it was really timely. If you don't mind my spoiling the end, it's he leaves the prison. You know, um, but I, I've been reading it since last August, in, interspersed with Herman Hesse's stuff. Okay. Um, just you know how reading happens. Let you me know. write that down. What was the yeah. name of the book? Memoirs from the House of the Dead. And uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's fascinating, um, but over the course of the whole year, I've been slowly getting my way through it, and uh, I finally finished with him leaving the prison um, while I leave Muncie. So that, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it was it was nice to read his thoughts um, and experience leaving a place, as I'm also leaving he was a the place. prisoner then, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it's a damn miracle people survived the, some of that stuff, mm. you know. Crazy stuff. I can't imagine it. Yeah, you know, you hear about those things like... Like, do I have the strength if I were in that situation? Yeah, you can't even fathom what it's actually like. And uh, yeah, and even when he writes on it, um, it's just, oh, this is just happening, you know? Um, He he doesn't have any blame for anyone. Uh, He doesn't seem angry Mm -hmm. about his situation. He's just thinking, well, this is what I'm doing now. Um, or at least that was my interpretation of Dostoevsky's thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a lot. Yeah, uh, man. But, yeah. Now, is this... How big is the book? Oh, it's not too large. I can bring it and back up. it's just up his account, like his experience mm-hmm. being in the prison in Siberia. Yeah. Uh, um, it's... If I'm not mistaken, I think it's um, it's pretty much his memoir, but in the guise of someone else's experience. Hmm. So... Uh, he pre- the, at the beginning, it's um, a guy goes into this old, uh, the person who's just passed away into his house and finds this memoir sitting in the bedroom. So mm, it's okay. not, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, I see. Yeah, and I haven't read the beginning of the book in, you know, eight or nine months, so <laughs> <laughs> who knows, I could be wrong. But uh, that's what I remember about I it. Try, yeah. Man, you got to make time. Like, last night, I, mm. I laid down, I'm like, I'm just going to read a few pages of this book. And yeah. Then, Slowly it's, get your way through, and mm. but I feel better after I read it. Now, what's yeah. the other book you said you were reading? Um, the well, past I've, year, the past year I've been reading Herman Hesse's books. What are those? Um, Narcissus that? and Goldman. He wrote Siddhartha, which is I think the more famous one. Um, but uh, Narcissus and Goldman, Rosald. Um, it, he's uh, he was a painter, uh, kind of a philosopher type person, uh, German. Or Swiss, one of those two. Mm-hmm. Um, but he he writes uh, on philosophy and music and connects oh. them, and sometimes religion, or uh, it's always someone's journey. Um, so you start at a time where they begin their journey, and then they eventually come full circle with uh, the people from the beginning of their journey, and they talk about what's gone on and 
how their concepts and ideas have changed. What, so Herman Hess writes Herman Hess. this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of different people's journeys. That's right. Are yeah. they true stories? Uh, I think a few of them are his own personal ones. Uh, I think one, if I can remember the name. No, I can't. Uh, it's basically his time as a schoolboy, um, and just how uh, he's you know from a small town, um, very intelligent, has all the potential in the world gets accepted to this really prestigious school and ends up going and um, it's not right for him or he meets a friend who leads him down maybe the wrong path or something. Mm, They find a relationship. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, you know, it's always terribly sad reading, but um, there's, it's interspersed with some beautiful parts and beautiful ideas on life. Uh, So... And philosophy of music is what you said? Yes. Too. There's always a little couple pages on music, and mm-hmm. uh, it's fascinating to read that. And I don't think he was a musician himself, but he seemed to understand music and was able to put it into words better than I could ever. Mm-hmm. So it's um, it's nice to read people much smarter than my <laughs> words, you know. Uh, it, it informs how I think about things. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, you got to look up to people who are... That's right. That's smarter than you. Yeah. The, <laughs> I think the idea I've been thinking of lately is uh, I don't have any of my own original ideas. I, mm, I just right. hear other ideas yeah. and I take those. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, man. Um, you change them out of hope, but, you know, it's still other people's thoughts uh, that become yours. It's Well, it's yeah, because, you know, you kind of maybe see that you agree with them or... Yeah. Like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I that's right. I believe that, too. <laughs> right. Um, I wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> Any what other books interest you? Anything um, else you've read in your life that well have impacted I mean, you? The Giver was the first one. I that sounds think familiar. Lois Lowry, and it was made into a terrible movie a couple of years ago. Uh, <laughs> but it's like a any dystopian kind of thing um, is really fun for me to to read. Dystopian. What does that mean? Like a 1984, um, a, either a future or. Um, know fake setting that's that could be in the future maybe but oh, where, I see. where life is future fake setting yeah is... life's not, not necessarily going so hot uh, so um yeah usually any story with uh characters that have become more resilient uh based on their settings and surroundings it's mm-hmm. fascinating for me to read interesting yeah, I, I find reading, um, which I didn't do much in college, I didn't find the time to do it. I, I was of just course. working on music, you know. Did you have to read any textbooks in college? A lot. Did you have to do any book, yeah. book work? Yeah, it was, that takes um, most of the time. Yeah, and I, I ended up doing a lot of, like, there was Roman history, there was history on the Tudors. Um, I ended up writing maybe 10-page papers every week, and it was not what I Girl. am good at or what I wanted to be doing. <laughs> it was It was a tough four years. Yeah, leisure reading in college is hard to attain. Yeah, how do you find time to do something you want to do when you're doing things you have to do? Um, yeah, it, it taught me how to find a balance between work sure. and personal life. I think, yeah, I, the idea of discipline comes to mind mm-hmm. when thinking about Yeah, waking up that. a little earlier to exercise, then have your coffee and read, mm-hmm. then do the the mind-numbing stuff is important. yeah. We've been trying to exercise after we drop our kids off, mm. you know. Yeah, I saw you're going on runs and stuff. I've always ran. There was a period of about two years in my 20s where I didn't run. Mm. Since high school, I started running because I, I found out I could do it <laughs> for like five minutes. And then I just got addicted to it, even yeah. though it's kind of like self-torture. I get that. I, I like swimming. Running, swimming? Running hurts me. Um, Man. I try to do it, but... <sighs> I'm too heavy. I have terrible technique, so I end up just hurting my shins and knees. So, well, yeah. shoes and li- li- lifting weights helps. Mm. Right shoes, and then keeping your muscles. Well, I've never bought the okay. right shoes. Yeah. So that might be it. Yeah. I think I've been wearing the same pair since 2011. I, I think running has just been the, the easiest. Okay, the easiest thing to go out and do, not mm. necessarily to. Yeah, do you don't need a, a gym sense. membership. Uh, you just need however long you need for the yeah. run. Yeah. So um, do you value exercise then? Do you try to exercise? I value long? it for sure. Yeah. I don't do it as much as I'd like to. Um, I see. But I'm hoping to change that when I move uh, starting on Friday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'll probably go for a run before 
my 10 hour drive back to South Carolina. Right, right. Yeah. So it'll be I, yeah, a slow process. You kind of run to get off, the, get out the anxiety and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. get the blood moving before you're <laughs> sitting on it for however long the drives are. You know? Yeah. So yeah. It's a good tactic. Are you dri- so you're driving there, man? I'm are you- uh, going back home to South Carolina for uh, a couple weeks. Um, oh, nice. Going to a couple okay. weddings and then uh, in mid-August I'll I'll move to nice. Connecticut. Nice. Yeah. I see. Are you you hauling it or? Nope. Uh, <laughs> I probably should. Uh, no, I've got an SUV. Um, so hopefully everything, I, I mostly have clothes and paintings uh, and a couple of gaming systems that Word. just gather dust. I, I use them for streaming Netflix and stuff rather than right. video games. Right. So I'm so bad at controlling characters on the TV, so I, I'd rather oh. passively watch. Okay, I thought, I thought you just maybe didn't have time to play games, but you want to. I probably have enough time in the day. Yeah, I don't have a job now, you know. So, uh, um, the only time my time is taken up is when I have a gig um, or a rehearsal for the gig. Um, so I have plenty of time to cool. to play video games. I just it's not something I value a lot. Um, I'd rather watch someone play video games and talk with them while while they play. But yeah, uh, I'm so bad at them. It's just it's just frustrating. <laughs> We seem like you'd have probably good hand-eye coordination because you're a musician, man. Come yeah, on. the the coordination's there. It's the the seeing what's on the screen. Um, and my the video games I play are old Star Wars ones, so nice. Um, yeah, so the graphics aren't always great, and uh, yeah, and video games now are just there's so much on the screen, and it just it looks so pristine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm definitely not quick enough with those, but the older ones are. Yeah, I don't. To get I don't have much there. experience with modern. Yeah. games. I was mostly a Zelda fan back in the day. Yeah. I'd fake being sick to stay home to play. <laughs> I've done that one a few times. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> I know, my mom's probably listening. <laughs> um, but it's funny because I actually I have a Wii system and I have a Zelda game I haven't been playing for years now. And I tried to set up a reward system for myself. Say, mm. if I put in a lot of work I'm going to have one day of the month and I'm just going to sit and play Zelda. I yeah. still haven't done that. <laughs> That's like, I just find other things to do. Yeah. Probably more productive things, make, I'm sure. But It needs to be more like, man, with, I don't know. Once <laughs> I make it to a certain point and I feel successful, then I'll play Zelda for eight hours. No. Yeah. Or once you're sick, maybe, then then play some stuff. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to find time to do... It's almost nostalgic going back to video games, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. There's always something else and probably something better to be doing. Uh, right. To, I clean my house, you know, I yeah, vacuum yeah. a lot. <laughs> That's why I don't have a lot of friends, I think. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, so back to you going to Yale. So you have a pretty light load then. Right now, I do. Um, I have a big band concert tomorrow night. Um, yeah, tomorrow night. Where? Uh, at Ball State's campus. Okay. Um, on the Arts Terrace. I'll have to find out where that is exactly, but I think you it's near the, the art museum, maybe on campus. Uh, but it's the Ball America's hometown State. band. State. Mm-hmm. Up in Muncie, correct? Yep. Okay. That's right, yeah. So like a mile from my apartment. I'll, awesome, man. I'll stop so, packing and play trombone. Yeah. It's going to be like your last performance and then you're outie. Yeah. It's exciting <laughs> and kind of sad, but yeah. yeah. you got to move on. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. excited for you. Well, thank you. So you'll spend time in South Carolina. Staying with your parents? That's right, yeah. Staying with my mom and uh, visiting friends and uh, and hopefully family who live near Charleston area. So I see. Maybe I'll work on my tan down at the beach. <laughs> and, yeah. Do they live close to the beach? Close enough, you know, yeah. an hour drive uh, that's manageable in a day. Um, and I live maybe three and a half hours from the beach and an hour or two from the mountains. So it's it's a good place oh, to be. Oh, there are mountains in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In there, over there. Yeah, down there. Uh, Wrong we're in the Midwest, sorry. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it'll be nice to to take a slow month-ish time to to relax and visit with family and prepare to be out on my own again. Reflect a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any siblings? I do. Mm-hmm. I'm a twin. Uh, so there's two oh, of me. Oh yeah. no. <laughs> Yeah, he, uh, a... no, it's great. Uh, he's uh, he's a wonderful cartoonist, um, but right now he re- repurposes wood with a, just a small company, and uh, 
he just got married to an old roommate of mine from Nashville, and he has a five-year-old son now. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Where does he live? Down in Greenwood, South Carolina. Wow. Yeah. Um, What's his name? Matt Anderson. Matt Anderson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's a cartoonist, and he refurbishes uh, furniture. He, he draws for fun. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of his hobby, uh, but he's so talented at it. Uh, he listens to a lot of music, so any any music that I've been listening to is probably his fault. You know, he <laughs> sends me, hey, listen to this. Or, um, like, what would he listen to, like, growing up? Anything. Um, so our, our dad uh, was pretty eclectic with the music he listened to. Um, we'd go from a Japanese opera singer to, you know, the Bee Gees. And, uh, yeah, it was just... That sounds uh, absurd. It was wild car it. rides, yeah. <laughs> um, so my brother got a lot of that... Um, taste in music so he'll go from you know nice folk americana style music to really uh, aggressive rap and hip-hop stuff <laughs> i think he puts that on there to just I like how you say that, aggressive rap yeah some of it's good um yeah he he listens to anything um i think lately ghost the i think their heavy metal has been his ghost go to yeah oh, maybe i have. I think it's like mm. devil worship music, okay. but with a good melody. Right. So anything that's <laughs> anything that's good, he'll listen to it. Um, yeah. Is that your only sibling then? Yeah, I have a half sister. I, I see. Haven't really dealt much with her in the last couple of years. She's in her forties now, so I see. Uh, yeah. That's yeah, a substantial range. age difference. Then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So mostly just the brother. Um, uh, yeah. He and I get to call on the phone when. He has a working phone. He hates technology and tries to be off really? of it as much as possible. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I understand that argument. I find when I have my phone away from me, I have a better day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, you experience the dopamine release whenever you're on your phone constantly. Oh, yeah. yeah, you can't get it back. you got to take yeah. a break. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, you know, with the media online, it's really easy to get hooked to it because you yeah. know i generate a lot of my um right especially you know, if you're doing your own promotions yeah. and i look at everything like hmm, how many <laughs> downloads do i have yeah Anybody are people liked liking it? things how many people have reached have it has it reached on yeah. my page but i think not thinking about that's helpful but yeah also helpful if you're expanding uh, it, it's interesting how to find that balance between being a little too overzealous with social media versus um finding a good thing that works in your time frame and in, in your day. Yeah. I haven't found it yet. <laughs> you haven't found the balance? <laughs> no. I mindlessly <laughs> scroll. I, I watch a lot of trombone stuff. Um, I think YouTube tells balance. me mm. once a week how much I've been listening to it a day. I'd rather not say, but it's... At least it's you know, trombone related and you're not watching... Some of the like, time. Like or, you know, yeah. Gangster fights. I, or whatever. I've had a few days like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the martial arts background, I watch a lot of um, oh, yeah. how to teach karate. and uh, So um, there's this YouTuber, Jesse Enkamp, um, who's on the Finnish or Swedish Olympic team. Uh, his brother's an MMA fighter or Bellator fighter. And he has a lot of ideas on the pedagogical approach to teaching martial arts. And um, it's not because I do teach at a school in Muncie, Indiana, at the Taekwondo school. Volunteer you still stuff. Teach? Sometimes. Oh, I, right on. I was going to ask so if you still times. Yeah. partake um, in the activities. When I have the time, uh, yeah, as long as I can still do the, the moves I need to do, um, I'm happy with it. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I'm definitely not qualified to teach martial arts anymore. Um, but it's still a big part of my uh, life philosophy, um, just the approach to teaching other people and sharing something you're passionate about. Uh, so watching karate videos is definitely a big yeah. time consumer <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> but, you know, then I, I do watch master classes or um, talks about music on YouTube a lot. I see. Yeah, that's what it's great for, too, is you learn. Everything's you on there. You can learn anything, really. Yeah. I, I, when my dishwasher broke a few weeks ago, I watched a YouTube video on how to fix there it. There you go. Yeah. Crazy stuff. (laughs) That's amazing. So, now, what do you, we're going to talk about your future. (laughs) Sure. What do you see yourself as doing in the future? Like, do you have any particular aim that you're striving for or, or... 
Um, What's up? Yeah, well, I guess the future seems so far away, but it's really close, I'm it's sure. It's here. Now. Yeah, I'm in it. <laughs> oh, it's gone. Uh, yeah, um, the ideal job would be to play in a professional full-time orchestra um, and to teach at a college. So those two, hand in hand, I, I love teaching and I love yeah. performing. I think a master's degree you, is, is your best ticket to be able yeah. to teach. It seems uh, at state schools you need a doctorate, um, but a lot of private schools, if you have a good enough resume and um, are personable enough, you mm -hmm. can most of the time get away with only having a master's degree. But I'll find out very soon. Um, but winning a job um, in an orchestra and teaching in a college is kind of the main dream for any, That's a, any, any classical. Any yeah. orchestra in particular or... Anything that pays mm -hmm. full time, you know. Um, Any type of genre that you would rather play, or or. Well, I love all music. Okay. Um, there's some exceptions, of course. Sure. Uh, pop country, I don't care for. Um, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, anything that would pay and be able to support a family is the the dream. Um, so as long as I have enough free time to spend the time with the loved ones and family, that's that's all I really need, you know. That's. Yeah, that's yeah. The, that's like the prime goal. Yeah. Of, of, well, particularly like like my podcast is finding those people that have that aspiration. Mm. How do they do it? What do they? How do they get through the tough times? You yeah, know? I don't know yet. It's just me. Um, so, for right now, um, I I'm just taking orchestra auditions. Uh, there's an audition for an orchestra in Connecticut. Uh, pretty much when I move mm. up there, so mm. it'll be. And I'll you can still hit the ground running. You can still audition even though you're in mm -hmm. school. They don't. Yeah. Do they require you to have any um, de degrees or credential? It depends on the orchestra. I see. Um, so, like, uh, if Cleveland Symphony has another audition, they've had maybe five or six in the last three or four years. <laughs> they still haven't hired anyone. Um, mm -hmm. But if I were to apply there, they'd probably make me send a tape and then say no, thank you. you mm -hmm. know? Um, but smaller regional orchestras. Um, usually will let you come audition uh, you, without a master's degree. Uh, but the bigger ones almost require it nowadays or require experience in other orchestras. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it just depends on the, the organization, I think. Um, but I, I play anything. I'll do jazz. I like doing Broadway-type stuff. Uh, I play a lot of different instrument, uh, different trombones. Uh, so doubling's a big thing for me. And, and do you own well. all of these? Trombones? I I own a small board tenor and a large board tenor and a bass trombone. Um, okay. So that's a symphonic, what you would see in an orchestra, tenor trombone and a, a symphonic a bass trombone and then a jazz style trombone, so for higher playing pretty hmm. much. Um, so, if I uh, do studio sessions, like uh, when I lived in Nashville, I played with uh, a singer songwriter. I just brought all of my instruments because I didn't know what to expect at the gig, so yeah, uh, I figured I should be ready for everything um, or anything. Yeah. yeah. So what do you play, like, like if it's just you and you're just hanging out? Like, what do you um, gravitate towards? <laughs> it depends on the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I get my routine in first. Um, so the parts of my playing that need work or, you know, that you need to spend time on every day so my long tones lip slurs mm. can I play in time and can I play in tune uh, once I check that box off um, then I move on to anything that's coming up like um, if I have a chamber music concert I'll work on the music for that if I have an audition I'll work on the excerpts for that particular audition um, I try and do a lot of solo playing so I'll work on the stuff that's for me I'll listen to if there are recordings of it out. Um, I have a duo with a saxophone player. Um, we just finished a tour, so I've been listening to a lot of contemporary music lately. And How do you pronounce his name? Jonathan Kiersby. Kiersby. Yeah. I read I read a little bit about yeah. uh, him. Yeah, he's well, a go-getter. It's, it's, a, it's a good project. Um, Is he living in South Carolina now? or We met at the governor's school, so the okay. art school we attended. Um, and then we kind of lost touch for our undergraduate degrees. He was in University of South Carolina, and I was at Vanderbilt. And then uh, I reached out to him since we were both in the Midwest, and I said, "Hey, man, let's play something." I, 
And if we can make money doing it, that'd be great too. Probably better. Um, <laughs> so I, I told him that and, um, yeah, he set up everything else. I didn't have to do a thing except show up and play. He's, uh, he's good at writing emails and organizing things. I see. So, uh, he you gotta it. have one of those guys. It's important. <laughs> yeah. I'll do the ideas. Um, but yeah, the, the paper works hard for me. Uh, it's, yeah. it's something I have to consciously do. Now, I looked up a video. Oh, man, what was it called? A video on your website, YouTube, playing something. Sure. <laughs> now, uh, I think the title had, like, day in it, some day or... Oh, um... This well, is terrible. Could be anything. I shouldn't know. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, it was, like, seven minutes of really eerie sounds. Oh, it was just the two of us in the yeah. duo. Yeah, Somewhere, Someplace Else. Somewhere, um, someplace else. By uh, Corey Reader. Um, that was part of a large group of commissions we did. Um, so since I didn't have a, f- like a part-time job or anything, I said we should set up a tour and try and pay rent with that or you know, at least make some money off of the tour. So. Now by commission, do you mean people called on you to play the music for them? Uh, we called them to write music for us. Um, so we, we called composers. Oh, and, I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we, uh, basically told them, hey, we'll perform at colleges, universities, um, at conferences, and, uh, and we'll make a recording with these pieces. So everyone seemed on board and, uh, yeah, we wrote grants for travel expenses. Um, well, Jonathan wrote grants, uh, I showed up and played. (laughs) It's a good situation. Um, yeah, we, we got to perform at like Ohio State, um, University of South Carolina. There's... Franklin College, Oakland University. We played at Marion University for a saxophone conference, uh, all with this weird eclectic music that is more soundscape or, um, uh, yeah. It made me think of some kind of Area 51, like, yeah, yeah, that piece scene is, um, where you maybe see a UFO, right? You know, and hear these weird sounds. Yeah, it was totally out of my comfort zone, that duo. Um, <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, That's the contemporary fun. music, uh, wasn't something I ever expected to play. Um, I like listening to it. Uh, performing it was a, a new experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was on the phone with the composers almost every day saying, how do I even read this? <laughs> what are you trying to do here? I, saw, and, I know, I saw you guys reading, thinking, yeah. what are they <laughs> reading, if anything? Yeah. Like like little aliens? <laughs> like jump, no, yeah, kidding. that piece was interesting. Uh, it was just pretty much... Um, the composer wanted to get out of the way of the performance. Um, so we wrote mm-hmm. something that wasn't musically complex. Um, we're just playing one or two notes at a time, and uh, and Jonathan's uh, circular breathing through it, so he doesn't really breathe at all. I can't do that, so I... Circular breathing. Yeah, where you blow out and play a note, and then uh, you keep air in your cheeks and push it out while you breathe in at the same time. What? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I can't do it. I'm going to probably practice that whenever yeah, you leave. Yeah, you can practice it with a straw and a cup and water. Um, <laughs> I've never practiced it, uh, but uh, it, it was interesting to play a piece like that where it's more, we're going to see what the what kind of uh, beats we can get from the intonation. Uh, there's a lot of microtonality going on. and um, yeah, for a So performer, you're going to experiment with it then? Yeah, and it's uh, it's divided into something like seven cells, um, and you can really do whatever you want from the performance side of it, in whatever order, and repeat things so it could go on indefinitely or if you wanted it, you know. Um, it's a really cool piece, uh, and I think the composer's uh, creating a CD uh, in the next year or so. Really? Yeah. Uh, so I think he's on his... Um, uh, Kickstarter right now. Kickstarter, to, to okay. And all that stuff, um, but it, it'll be a CD of all chamber music, and uh, yeah, I think he's spent a lot of time in Germany. So his, uh, I think the the publisher or the um, yeah, the CD company is a German one. Um, mm-hmm. So it'll it'll be interesting to hear that music. Um, it's the more I listen to it, the more I enjoy listening to it. Um, but it. it Music like that, you sometimes need context before you go in and experience it. I see. Uh, so we, we, as a duo, we tried to give context for the music um, and let the audience know, hey, this is maybe what you could listen to 
or this is what the composer had in mind. Um, and I think that helps out a lot um, when you listen to experimental music. You gotta kind of tell them. <laughs> yeah. A little, I, mean, I think uh, it's the same with abstract pop. art, right? Yeah, you kind of need to know, well, I could do this, right? You know, or, um, yeah, you just put paint in a, uh, a water gun and shot it at the canvas, right? Uh, but sometimes there's more meaning. Sometimes mm-hmm. there's not. Um, yeah. But uh, it just depends on the piece or the, the composer or the see. performers. Splendid. It was interesting. But yeah. Yeah. I, the more I listen to <laughs> that, it's nice. Interesting and cool. Like, that's, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah. That piece helps me with, during my meditation in the morning. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it's just, you know, it's a soundscape. Um, ah. Yeah. So and, you, uh, yeah. Now, I did want to get back to your... Mm. I did want to talk about how Sam Harris has influenced you. Would you say he's maybe the most influential? Um, I think it started with Jordan Peterson, um, okay. just taking responsibility. Um, a lot of Sam Harris's podcast is way over my head with the guests he brings in. Okay. So I, I find it fascinating listening to people way more intelligent than I am speak about their own Keeps you on your toes, like... Yeah, it keeps me going back to Google saying, what's that word, you know? (laughs) Um, Correct. Yeah, um, so lately he's been one of the more influential podcasters I've been listening to. Um, We need to look into that one. Yeah. Because I've started watching some of his debates with Peterson online, but I just kind of gave up after a second. Sure, yeah, and what he says is always um, thoughtful. I Mm -hmm. think he's more to the left politically and... Uh, it's nice hearing um, a thoughtful representation of that political spectrum, um, though I'm sure people will think he's all right uh, if he's in the intellectual dark web, mm-hmm. right? So who knows? Um, Still trying to understand what those things mean, but... I don't have a grasp on it yet. <laughs> I can't help you with that. <laughs> uh, I know one's an elephant, like one's a donkey. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right, yeah. I know which one. Mm. So you meditate every morning? Uh, I I try to not meditate so much as just focus on my breathing. I see. Now, um, do you listen to the, the to the Sam Harris? Now, the, Sam Harris has... He has an app for meditating. The app for meditating. Which okay. I haven't bought yet or okay. downloaded. Um, so you don't listen to that not, in the morning? Not as much as I'd like. Every now and then, if I'm, I'm feeling particularly overwhelmed. Does he talk? Overwhelmed. He does. The- yeah. Um, he kind of guides you through a meditation, and it's... Just a way to kind of be present, um, but for me, the meditating is more. Um, can I be mindful throughout the day? So there's always those thoughts that just stick in your brain, and um, you can't get them out. So uh, if I'm having a conversation with someone, I'll kind of go back to my breathing and just think in and out, uh, even while I'm speaking. I'm breathing right now. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's surprising what benefits it has. Um, just in every day. I notice when I'm real anxious, I'm not breathing as much. Yeah, and you kind of keep all the air trapped inside. Yeah, and, it's and I notice it vicious. too. I try to breathe. But yeah. I still go back. Me too. Man. Even when I talk, I, <laughs> I forget about it. Um, but in the morning, I start with uh, just maybe 30 seconds of just focusing on my breath. Um, I see. And that's the that's not that long. It. No. You know. It makes a difference, though. Um, and driving, that's the same thing. I'll turn on a podcast and just focus on my breath. Uh, so I feel relatively relaxed thr- throughout the day, um, even during stressful situations. I see. And then faking a smile helps a lot, too, <laughs> I find. I hear, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, kind of smile by default sometimes. Yeah. Except for if I'm tired at work. People seem to like you more <laughs> if you smile, right? So I, yeah, I it's, try to do that. You're definitely more personal and, like, mm-hmm. Man, you know, and I find myself thinking of all things that Peterson says, like, people are going to, you're going to have more opportunity if right. you're more open. That's right. And I agree. At least smile. That's the first step, I think. <laughs> Make yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Do you swim? Now, you say you swim. I did. Um, you I did. swam uh, for a couple years in high school. Okay. Um, uh, not any long you, distance, but... Do you still, do you swim any... When I have a pool. Uh, yeah. I I never ended up getting an ID, so I couldn't go into the rec centers at Ball State because I... Oh, bummer. Yeah, well, I didn't want to walk up the stairs and get the printed off badge, you know, so 
Um, I think I was having weird a good things that session. you procrastinate that you shouldn't procrastinate, but yeah, you do. Yeah, little things like walking across the street <laughs> um, to get something that you probably could use every day. Um, so I, I didn't for the past two years, um, but at Vanderbilt, I um, with my trombone studio, I'd take a couple of them to the pool and we'd swim laps. And uh, for me, it's just a place where I can. It feels like flying, um, and then you just feel better the rest yeah. of the day. Especially in water, mm-hmm. I noticed that. Yeah, it, it, it was really helpful, um, mentally and physically. You try to swim and enough to get your heart rate up mm-hmm. for an extended period of time. Yeah, and uh, as a trombonist, sometimes I'll swim for breath support. Uh, so oh, I'll, yeah. I'll think, oh, I'm going to swim down to the other end of the pool uh, in one breath. So I'll take the breath before, I'll swim, and take one breath in the middle of the lane and uh, it makes me swim a little faster because yeah. you run out of air pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, That's another yeah. thing I, I, I notice about running. Running is a mm. great way to... That helps you practice your breathing. That's that's how I kind of quell my yeah. anxiety. When when I do run, I, I kind of count and breathe. So I'll breathe in for two or three counts or four counts at the beginning. Mm-hmm. By the end, it's breathing in on every step and breathing out on the other step. Uh, depending on how tired I am. You ever am. try to breathe through your nose the whole time? I've tried. It's not People for me. People say that that makes it a better run, but I, I might have tiny nostrils because yeah. it just, <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah, I have a weird thing where at any time, any given time, only one of my nostrils really work. Um, Which so one is See, I've noticed oh, it changes. My, I notice my left one is a little smaller yeah. than my right. It, it makes it harder to breathe through the nose. Yeah, Mine's just depending on what they want. To do, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Maybe if you practice, I don't know, maybe just practice breathing through, through your nose. Yeah, maybe it'll clear some stuff out, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. so I, I don't do that when I run. Uh, I, I just breathe through my mouth and mm-hmm. get really thirsty really quickly. I know, I'm like, did I look like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I look like I went for a swim when I finished my runs, but... Right. Yeah. All right, man. Do you have any advice you could give me and our listeners? Yeah. Um, well, for me, I've made more progress in my life uh, as a person and as a musician. Um, just finding something to do that gives me passion. Um, so whatever that is for anyone, I think that's the, the best thing you can do. Uh, don't wake up every day and hate what you're doing. Wake up and be excited about it. It changes day to day, of course, but um, yeah. So for me, doing music uh, is an outlet for all of my emotional distress or happiness. Um, I can share my ideas with people, uh, share my music. Um, I I had a teacher a while back who said, uh, um, you have something to say and nothing to prove. And I think that's a really important message to hear. Uh, As far as anything, playing Playing music, um, being on stage or... Anything that you're sharing with someone or anyone uh, where you're kind of sharing your heart with someone, uh, it's your your art, it's your work, um, it's in your hands, uh, and you want to share that as authentically as possible, but you don't have anything to prove, you know, so the quality isn't up in question, it's just what, you, what you're able to share. Amazing. So it's, sorry, say it again. (laughs) Uh, You have something to say and nothing to prove. You have something to say and nothing to prove. I like that. Yeah, I think as an artist it's it's important Mm -hmm. to remember. You forget it so quickly. Um, Yeah, well it goes back to the idea of, you know, not competing with people. Yeah. Just... Just doing what you want to be doing. Besides yourself. Exactly, yeah. You try and improve... um, there's always things to be better at, um, but if you're sharing what you're passionate about, whether that's in the arts or in life, I think uh, it's valuable. Yeah, everyone has everyone has something unique they can share. Yeah. Everyone, like any, everyone could have their own podcast. They, everyone could have something unique that they could say or some different story they could tell. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. And it's, I think it's a good. Not to get caught up in that, you know, like the competition of it. It is to a certain degree, but, right. you know. Right, and competition's important. Yeah. Um, 
I was just at this week long Termone Festival where international musicians. Oh, all, really? Now you tell me that. Yeah. And you you get to see um, people in your own age range and how good they are, and uh, it's exciting it to see. It's inspiring, you know? Yeah. it's It gives you incentive to practice and inspiration to practice, but it also shows you um, they're just people too. Yeah. They're working on their craft, and, um, and if you can share it, that's the best way, I think. It's no fun to do art alone, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm so miserable painting and drawing. Yeah. Because I would if, get stir-crazy. <laughs> right, <laughs> and you get stuck in the house all the time, and, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So if you can share anything that you have a passion about, that's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, and then it's just a matter of finding those, either the one thing or, you know, the few things that... Yeah, and if there's multiple Man. things, that's great. One of the the clues to that, one of the clues to that is, like, if, if you get excited about it, if you get nervous, mm. if you find that your heart rate increases just a little bit, that's a clue to something that you're passionate about and something that you probably might need to start putting some attention on. Right. Yeah. You know? So that's that's how I knew that this podcast was mm. a good idea, because yeah. like, my heart... It's a little scary, especially before you start um, the conversation. Oh, yeah. Was the mic on? And are we going to have something to talk about? I was, yeah, my hands are still sweating, I think. Really? Yeah. I, you know, I don't ever think of anybody else, the other, the guest being nervous. I guess mm. I don't think about that. Yeah. I guess I'm so focused on myself. <laughs> I think that's okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think being nervous before anything... Um, that's valuable doing is a worthwhile It's nuanced, experience. too, and that's why it's like you're on the edge, you know? Right. It it's builds like, character, too. I make sure I have every... My, my house is clean, my stage is set. Mm. Um, I have to do a little research, a little writing. Yeah, you had a whole page there. That's incredible. I yeah. didn't know you could fill up a page about me. I, I yeah. love... I found out I love writing, so... That's awesome, <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I'm going to write... Like, what I'll do is I'll write... I'll listen to this, write an introduction... And then, awesome. Um, record that before the actual interview. Cool. And then that'll introduce this interview. So yeah. Well, let me know before it goes out. Totally. I'll, I'll love to share it with people. I know. I'm yeah. glad. I'm so glad that you were able to come right before you leave. You know. Yeah, me too. I'm glad. So we who could knows where in. you'll be? Who New knows Haven, where this will take you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and anywhere that has a job, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, music. you could tour around the world. You can. You know. I'd love to. Yeah. Have you ever gone international? I've been to Europe a couple times for music. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've toured uh, the Midwest and the South. Uh, yeah, so hopefully I'll go another time. Outer um, space. Yeah, you know, whenever the space force <laughs> happens, right? But yeah. The um, Mars Orchestra or Symphony and Orchestra. That'd be great. Yeah, <laughs> be a frontier. I'm so funny. Yeah. No, um, so. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for your inspiration and advice, man. Yeah. A little motivating. Thanks for having me, Jade. I'm glad yeah. you could make it today. Me too. Glad yeah. you didn't get too lost on the way here. Just a little lost, <laughs> yeah. I have a GPS, it helps. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. Great talking with you. Absolutely. Where can our listeners find you online? I have uh, a Facebook, uh, Sam Anderson or Samuel Anderson, um, an Instagram, uh, Basebone Sam. And a YouTube channel. If you type in Samuel Anderson Trombone, you'll probably find my channel. Um, I hope to expand videos and add things to the content. I was going to say, I expect to see some orchestra performance. There will be some of that up there soon. Performances in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. So, cool, man. Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you join us on the next episode of Artist Solace. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.